but it's also a great pleasure because CORE does an amazing job. The uh, ability it has to bring together a coalition of different uh, groups to work towards um, change in this area is impressive, plus of course always good for an organisation like uh, British Institute to have um, funding for some of our research as well. And I uh, also want to thank um, uh, Phil Bloomer and those at the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre because all of us rely on that incredibly, time and time again. A brilliant job. Now as um, uh, Marilyn said, this is a terribly practical area as well as of course an area where one needs to know um, the, the case law, we need to know the, the ideas, the concepts and things. So I'm going to begin by putting us in northern Peru. There's a community in northern Peru who were a farming community largely, and then they found that there was copper in the area. The company came in in 2003. They began mining, and the uh, people of that community were rather uh, astonished and appalled. They'd never been consulted about this. And the Peruvian state said, oh, of course you can come into the company. These people, uh, it's not their land. We can do whatever you like. Which, of course, was not actually the case un under Peruvian law. So there were protests. And they protested at the gates of the uh, mining company. Uh, and what happened was the protesters were arrested. They protested again. A whole lot of them were pushed into the uh, offices of the company, at least 30 of them. Two of them alleged they were sexually assaulted. The rest were tortured. What happened? The company said it had nothing to do with them, but they were just using the premises. Action was then brought by the group, by the community, under Peruvian law. The prosecutor refused to take action. Instead, brought a claim against them. It's these kind of cases that are real life cases for the people who are affected about an access to judicial remedies. It's these kind of people around the world who need the support, need the intellectual, legal, and moral support to be able to take action to obtain a remedy. And it's based on this that four of us put together, under the funding of CORE and, and uh, others, the third pillar, which I suspect all of you have now in front of you. Hopefully you've read cover to cover, he says, hopefully. Um, and our approach, just to put a bit of academic methodology behind this, our approach was to uh, examine uh, and, and analyze the obstacles in place for the third pillar. We hear a great deal about the first two pillars, the state's uh, duty to protect and the corporate responsibility to respect. Time and time again, we hear very little about the third pillar. In fact, I gave a talk just recently at the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and they admitted in their national action plan the UK barely refers to the ability to bring any kind of remedy. So it's important that this part, this crucial part of the guiding principles is brought to life. And within that, in the, in the guiding principles, it says to use their commentary. It's important to have those business enterprises uh, responsible where the people and the victims cannot access the home state courts regardless of the merits of the claim. So our focus were on the key industrialized states where a large number of the transnational corporations operate. So we looked closely at Canada, France, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, the UK, and the US. And in order to do this, we sent questionnaires to legal practitioners, to, to NGOs, judges, and others, and took, undertook consultations in Brussels, in Washington, in London. And we also uh, conducted a, key case studies, and in, in particular, we had consultations where we brought together people and found out what were the key issues on the ground. And so what we then do, because it's, it's meant to be of assistance, at, you'll find at the back we do give recommendations, specific recommendations, and I'm going to take us, us, us through that. And the way I'm going to take you through that is as if you were conducting a claim. Let's say you have these um, a Peruvian community who come to you. What do you do? How do you even begin by commencing the claim? Who are the people who you want to commence against? And what are the kind of claims you might make? And what are the outcomes? So part of it is going to be gathering evidence. So there's going to be issue of disclosure, trying to persuade the company to disclose enough information for that action to occur. So our recommendations were this. The starting point is the key concept of human rights due diligence. It's a key concept, an important concept. 
but one which is still largely undefined. It's still being worked out what it means. It certainly means there needs to be policies in place and action in place. And those actions include possibly a human rights impact assessment, possibly includes transparency, tracking, reporting back and consultation. Those are probably the elements of a human right due diligence. And what we said is that has to apply for every single business enterprise to all parts of its operation, not just to its own perhaps headquarters. And that's quite important because it begins to expand and it's in keeping with a decision of the uh, UK Court of Appeal in Chandler and Cape, which said basically the parent can very often influence what happens across all their enterprise. We would also, as part of this, say that we should be increasing the reporting requirements. As has happened, the guiding principles now apply. The equator principles about finance projects now include requirements of human rights uh, reporting. The uh, International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank, requires as part of their performance standards that there should be human rights reporting. And of course, under the EU, the EU has recently passed a directive on a non-financial transaction requiring reporting uh, requirements. So more and more there's this increased requirements on corporations as part of their due diligence. The second thing we argued was adopting the Brussels One regulation approach. Those of you who are EU specialists will know that Brussels uh, One uh, sets out that the domicile of a company is enough to bring a claim against it. So that doesn't mean they just need to be registered. It could be their main place of business, even if they're not registered there. So you're able to bring a claim against a domiciled um, corporation. And this also means that it overcomes some of the issues which are sometimes called extraterritorial. I prefer the term transnational. We're talking about transnational corporations. Why don't we talk about transnational law? We talk about extraterritorial. We're already beginning to put a block in the understanding that this is somehow or other beyond the state's jurisdiction. And clearly it's just part of the transnational activity of the corporation. And we also say that in doing this, we also have to be aware of Rome too, another European uh, regulation, which talks about applicable law. This is relevant, for example, in the case um, against Shell in the Dutch courts, uh, ACPAN, where the court said that in fact, you might be able to bring a claim against Shell as, as the parent company, but the Nigerian courts, which is a court where it happened, is the applicable law and you couldn't bring a claim under that law. So there are still difficulties trying to work around situations where you might be able to consider where they, the home state rather than the host state um, could be the applicable law. It's worthwhile exploring some of those areas. The other thing we argued is a notion called forum necessitatis which has been used in the Dutch courts, which allows a forum where there's no other place that can pro provide an effective remedy. And that gets around the position, particularly still uh, existing in the US and the Canadian courts, about um, forum non-convenience, that you cannot bring a case there because it's in not the right place because it's not where the accident occurred, not where the people are, etc. So that's a fallback. If you can't get through the, the position of the domicile, Think about getting where it's the only place to get an effective uh, remedy. And finally, we recommend that legislation across Europe to improve access to evidence, to improve the disclosure position, because that can be an extremely difficult e element for many victims. OK, so let's say you've commenced the claim. Where do we go from that? Well, what we found is once a claim commences, the nature of the claim can be an obstacle. In private law actions, then it's within tort law or law of obligations. And in fact, in this instance, in the Montereco case, it was, of course, tort law in the UK. There can also be a public law claim under criminal law. And that's, in fact, where most of the European civil system operates, is under criminal law, these actions. We don't have it much in, in the UK or, or in other common law countries, but largely it's been the method, with it, if any, within a civil law system, where victims can be joined as, as, as party civil into the um, action. But of course, it has to be pursued by the public prosecutor. So let me give you another case. In 2007, Amesis, which is a French technology company, signed a contract with Libya, Libya to deliver analysis hardware and software for electronic communications. It was not long thereafter, once it began in operation, Surprisingly, a large number of uh, those who were resisting the Gaddafi regime seemed to be arrested. And 
they said it was because of the communication system. The Mises said, no, of course it wasn't that. But after the revolution, the documents were found. It was clear that there was complicity by Mises within what the Libyan um, government was doing. But the pro public prosecutor refused to open the investigation. There was a complaint against them. This is in the French courts. The investigating judge then tried to investigate, um, went on appeal, refused, great deal of blocks in the way. And our, our experience in undertaking this research was that very often that is the case. The prosecutor is not prepared to bring an action. Could be for lots of reasons. They may be the biggest employer in the town in which the prosecutor is, is situated. They could be a very influential um, company within the particular state. It could be simply uncertainty of the law by the prosecutor. So our recommendation was it vital to train pub, uh, public prosecutors and train legal officers and have judicial oversight of these decisions. And that's a crucial area for the, uh, the general development in this area. In addition, criminalizing the human rights violations by business enterprises can be quite crucial. Very often, if it's a criminal trial against a corporate, the corporate might be more willing to act on it than if it's a long-term, maybe slow-moving uh, tort claim. And also, we suggested a possible improvement of the role of victims in the criminal law process rather than being pretty inactive members. And in addition, related to this, particularly, and only, of course, in civil actions, who can bring the claim is also relevant, because class actions are very largely used across uh, the US, but not so much across in, in Europe. And um, uh, in fact, it can lead to problems. In fact, in the Montereco case, when the victims were given compensation at the end of the case, it was only the 33 victims that actually um, pursued the case who were given compensation, not the rest of the community, because there wasn't ability of an easy class action. So part of our recommendation is to reform collective actions across Europe. Okay, you've got to that stage, you've managed to get to, to a case. What about, sadly enough, the situation which is very relevant, the costs and the remedies? Costs are a major obstacle, both for the victims and the lawyers. And there's a significant inequality. We only, only need to see the action between Chevron and Ecuador, many actions around the world, many different locations, stretches the resources incredibly. We do not have what's called an equality of arms. And of course, then the governments can, st can stand in to support the, the business. We see that in relation to the UK with their changes in the uh, legal aid provisions, effectively supporting corporates. So our recommendation is that we need to have legislation to remove these financial barriers uh, and to extend legal aid to cover these situations. And appropriate reparation, not just financial reparation. We often think of remedies only in financial terms. But in fact, for the victims on the ground, there could be a range of reparations, which could be things such as improving the water systems, improving housing, a whole range of things which, for example, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has been quite active in looking at the re reparations beyond just um, financial. I would also add, though it's not in our recommendations, looking at the non-judicial grievance mechanisms. Uh, they are one means often never to get to the law but which very often can be abused because sometimes companies say, yes, we've got a non-judicial um, method to, to express your grievance, but if you do, you can't then bring a legal action. There's also, of course, finally a, a problem which we, don't, we only touch on, but which I think is a, is, can be one from the victim's perspective. The actual um, uh, claims, the actions, are not expressly in human rights terms. For example, in the Motoreco case, the claim was, as I said, about torture and rape. But you can't bring a claim for torture and rape under a civil law action of tort. So how do you bring it? You bring it for negligent management and instigating a trespass to persons. If you're a victim of rape, a trespass to the person is not really what you're complaining about. And I have this difficulty that in the end, the idea of human rights, the powerful, challenging idea of human rights, gets a bit lost in actually once we get to a legal claim, not being able to use directly, of course indirectly, but not directly, the claim of human rights. So I would recommend that we move towards a situation where we do can, are able to bring the claim in human rights terms and the victims will then feel their real um, 
access to remedy has been available. So Robert, having, may I give you a two minute uh, warning? Okay, about to finish. So what we found in this is there are many obstacles to access judicial remedies and actually it requires innovative lawyers, some of which we have here. It requires judges who are prepared to be brave a bit on this, tireless NGOs and extremely patient victims. But we need probably more hard law and also pressure on states to put in place access to remedies so that in the end, the victim's voices are able to be not only heard, but to obtain a remedy. Thank you.